ARF skills and procedures are highly specialized, requiring specially trained individuals. Remember that life safety is always the first priority above all else. Every emergency is different, but there are standard operating procedures that apply in virtually every incident. Knowing and using these procedures will enhance your response. The initial objective of the first arriving ARF vehicle should be the immediate reduction of the critical fire area. ARF personnel must control this area to ensure fuselage integrity and provide an escape area for aircraft occupants. Control time is the period of arrival from the first ARF vehicle and discharge of its agent to the reduction of 90% of fire intensity. Control time should not exceed one minute. Existing fire and crash conditions will govern the placement of firefighting apparatus for the initial attack. To facilitate passenger evacuation, fire-threatening escape paths should be controlled and extinguished as soon as possible. Other non-threatening fires involving unoccupied sections of the fuselage or wing sections may be left for later arriving units. At times, it can be difficult to distinguish between rescue and extinguishment activities because they are interrelated and often performed simultaneously. After aiding evacuation efforts, apparatus should be repositioned to control the main body of fire threatening fuselage integrity. The next action is typically gaining access to the interior and preventing or controlling the spread of interior fire. Use a vehicle public address system, bullhorn or verbal commands, and hand signals to direct evacuating occupants to a safe location. If an exterior incident is controlled, signal to pilots to avoid unnecessary evacuation. Most ARF guidelines recommend positioning off the nose or tail of the aircraft, whichever is upwind. If there are at least two apparatus, each takes a side of the aircraft, positioning to the side of the nose or tail. Wreckage, terrain, evacuating survivors, and wind all affect proper apparatus position. Using tarps and cones, a triage area should be located in the closest safe upwind location to the rescue operation. Landing zones for air ambulance helicopters should be far enough away to avoid noise or rotor wash problems. In stressful situations, strong leadership and scene control are essential. The Incident Command System, or ICS, is a unified management system that defines an action plan as well as roles for all responders. The ICS will help organize emergency situations, control resources, identify and prioritize objectives, develop and implement plans, and assign responsibilities. Well-defined organizational structure is one of the strengths of ICS. The incident commander is its leader. The command staff includes information, liaison, and safety modules. The general staff modules are operations, planning and intelligence, logistics, and finance and administration. Personnel in charge of each ICS module should wear a vest indicating area of responsibility. A command post should be located in an upwind location where a unified command can be established. Key players in the ICS team can include the fire department, law enforcement, air carriers, emergency medical services, airport management, the Red Cross or other relief organizations, and regulatory agencies. Cooperation is vital because no single organization can do it all. Clear communications can be challenging. Every incident needs a communication plan. The incident commander must establish an incident action plan, or IAP, for future response actions. There can be only one incident action plan. The IAP identifies the objectives of incident control, the strategy to pursue, and the direction for future actions. Advanced planning in the IAP ensures that necessary resources will be available. Gaining control of an aircraft emergency situation requires the development of unique strategies and tactics. Consult passengers and cargo manifests, if available, to determine how many passengers and or what types of cargo are on board. Use thermal images to locate hotspots for extinguishments and overhauls. The area of a major aircraft high-impact crash should be surrounded and divided into geographical quadrants. Security needs to be set up surrounding the entire vicinity of the crash site. Involved structures may have to be written off to concentrate on structures that can be saved. Efforts should be made to preserve the dignity of victims of an aircraft accident. Bodies and debris should be protected and undisturbed.
bodies and body parts should be covered or shielded from media and bystanders. In a low-impact crash, fuel spill fires will often spread to the aircraft interior, making control much more difficult and threatening persons still on board. In some low-impact crashes, wing impact damage and the forward motion of the aircraft may cause the bulk of the fire to occur between the wings and the tail. An essential factor affecting aircraft occupant survival is the size of any fuel spill fire around the aircraft. Spill fire produces radiant heat and direct flame contact with the fuselage. This allows buildup of fatal interior temperatures and toxic products of combustion. Vehicles should position around an aircraft to quickly control fuel spill fires and protect the fuselage. Agent conservation should be an integral element of the fire attack strategy. Avoid becoming a victim of monitor madness trying to accomplish all firefighting using turret streams. Move up, modulate, pump, and roll to achieve the most effective agent application and control all the spill fire. As soon as the spill fire is knocked down, deploy hand lines to extinguish fires out of turret reach and any interior fire spread. The preferred method of controlling interior fires is the use of the penetrator nozzle. Firefighters will usually not know if everyone is out of the aircraft until the fire is controlled and systematic searches have been conducted. The site of occupant evacuation affects ARF positioning. Cabin crews are trained to determine outside conditions before opening doors and not use exits directly threatened by fire. Unless no other option exists, most people will not attempt to escape through a fire. If the flight crew has begun evacuating the occupants, the first arriving unit should establish a safe exit area to continue evacuation and make sure that the escape chutes remain intact and free of fire impingement. If the fuselage is not intact, more than one rescue area may need to be established. Once the fuselage skin is penetrated, fire usually spreads quickly through the interior. When the fuselage is damaged or breached due to impact forces, interior fire spread will occur even sooner. Water is an excellent cooling agent to protect the fuselage. If there is only one ARF apparatus, that unit will have to work the entire fuselage fire area. If multiple ARF units are present, each can be assigned to an area of the fuselage. Discharge foam parallel to and along each side of the fuselage. Another technique is to position off the side or perpendicular to the fuselage. This provides a better view of the entire fuselage, fire and evacuation situation. Foam can be bounced or deflected off the side of the fuselage. This position can provide better access and agent application to fire burning under the aircraft. Wind tends to push fire. Most of the fire and heat will be at the downwind end of the fuselage. If firefighters are on the ground investigating a hazard, assisting in evacuation, or manning hand lines, it is advisable to staff a vehicle with a turret to provide a protective stream if needed. A handline should always be employed when using forcible entry tools on an aircraft to prevent the heat created by the tools from igniting new fires. Firefighters using handlines who become too hot can protect themselves by opening the nozzle to a wide fog pattern to block heat while they reposition to a safer position of attack. ARF personnel must comply with local, state, and federal requirements for handling and disposal of hazardous material. Firefighters should prevent hazardous runoff from flowing into storm drains, culverts, wetlands, and waterways. Notify the responsible environmental agencies and take no further action to dilute or dispel the fuel unless directed to do so by the responsible agency. As soon as possible, firefighters should stabilize wreckage and make the scene safe for rescue operations. Disconnect batteries. Shut down power sources. Plug or capture fuel leaks. Contain or cover runoff with foam. And crib or shore up larger fuselage sections. Mechanics and maintenance personnel can aid in the stabilization and control of wrecked aircraft. The resources immediately available for incident response may be insufficient. Off-airport fire companies may be able to provide additional equipment, such as water tankers, tenders, foam and foam apparatus, large diameter hose, salvage and ventilation units, light and power units, waterborne resources, and elevating and aerial apparatus. 
Off-airport companies may also be able to provide command vehicles, communication vehicles, helicopters, and air units. Finally, off-airport personnel may be needed for hazmat response, urban search and rescue, medical response, and so on.